Here's you, here's Matt, there's you, there. This is Saturday Night Live, and it has a reputation for being hit and miss. When SNL misses, it isn't always because the cast is just having an off night. The writing process of Saturday Night Live is largely centered around whomever is hosting. They work alongside the writers to deliver content that is reflective of who they are. This is great when someone like John Mulaney or a comedic-minded actor like Tom Hanks hosts the show, but when a host is selected that doesn't really have comedic chops, things get a little weird. This is exactly what happened in 1991 when Steven Seagal hosted the show. I hope you'll forgive me for being a little bit serious, but it's important to me to let you know that there's a lot more to Steven Seagal than the martial arts. Before we get started, don't forget to like and subscribe to Nerdstalgic if you haven't done so already. Saturday Night Live is America's longest-running sketch comedy series. It began production in 1975 and has been a proving ground for some of the funniest people in the world. Legendary names like Bill Murray, Eddie Murphy, Tina Fey, Kristen Wiig, and Will Ferrell, among a laundry list of others, all got their start screaming, In 1991, Saturday Night Live was at the top of its game. The cast was filled with not only talent, but outright comedy legends. Chris Farley, Mike Myers, Chris Rock, Dana Carvey, Phil Hartman rounded out the performing cast, while the writer's room was filled with names like Conan O'Brien, Bob Odenkirk, and Robert Smigel. It was truly a renaissance era for the show, and audiences were tuning in en masses to watch the hilarious antics and colorful characters created by the ensemble. Making copies, the McStingster, Stingatone. Sting. <laughs> also reaching the top of his game was rising action star Steven Seagal, who is currently on track to rival Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone at the box office with hits like Marked for Death and Out for Justice. Saturday Night Live is constantly on the lookout for rising stars to host their shows. It's what drives their ratings. They look for notable people of fame from almost every realm imaginable. This is all part of what piques the audience's interest and generates ratings for the show. Political candidates like Al Gore and John McCain, sports stars like Charles Barkley and Lance Armstrong, even public figures like Howard Cosell and Steve Forbes have all hosted the show to varying degrees of success. In 1991, Steven Seagal was wrapped gaining a reputation for being a box office draw, so, of course, it made sense for Saturday Night Live to invite him to host. This turned out to be a colossal mistake. Man, your daughter sure does take her time. What? Does that bother you? N no. No. On Saturday Night Live, the host is completely enmeshed with the creative process every step of the way. Writers work tirelessly to pitch their sketches and ideas in hopes of getting them onto the show. It's an incredibly competitive process, as some of the writers are trying to become performers themselves, or at the very least, advance their careers as comedy writers. The quota varies, but basically, each writer is required to pitch dozens of ideas to the host and cast. The host then decides which sketches are best suited for them and those are the sketches that end up on the show. From that point on, the host works with the writers and cast leading up to the dress rehearsals and inevitable airing of the show. Sometimes this creative process works incredibly well. Sometimes great SNL hosts can even feel like they're part of the ensemble. Steve Martin has been invited back to host so many times, most people have no idea that he was never even a cast member. We are two wild and crazy guys! <laughs> Many celebrities have had such a positive experience working on SNL that they have created reoccurring characters for themselves and have even received best of DVD compilations. However, when a host shows up that doesn't understand comedy, the show can feel a little too flat. Or when they have a young host with a carefully manicured career trajectory, the show ends up playing things a little too safe. The end result is that these episodes can feel boring and lackluster in comparison to others. The Steven Seagal episode was a disaster for the entire Saturday Night Live creative process. From start to finish, Steven Seagal was a hindrance to pretty much everyone he came into contact with. One of the main reasons for this is that Steven Seagal had never even seen an episode of SNL before arriving to host the show. During the writing process, he would pitch extremely problematic and insane ideas. David Spade recounted in an interview that this was actually the first time in his career that SNL thought about replacing the host in favor of just doing an all-cast show. Julia Sweeney said that one of Seagal's ideas involved a sexual assault survivor getting sexually assaulted by their therapist. Tim Meadows described the creative process of working with Seagal quite concisely when he said, you can't explain something to someone in German if they don't speak German. 
when the person you are writing material for cannot comprehend what you're going for, you have to boil things down until you come up with something that they can actually follow. In the case of Steven Seagal, the only thing he understood was his pseudo-tough guy persona. Oh, I know what you're thinking. Mine's bigger than yours, right? It's not fair. Throw it away. And a smattering of abrupt violence, and this episode is a direct reflection of that. The cold open features Hans and Franz, played by Dana Carvey and Kevin Nealon, respectively. The sketch seems like it would be a home run with the involvement of Steven Seagal playing against their obsession with Arnold Schwarzenegger. However, unlike many successful performers, Seagal just refused to poke fun at himself. Bob Odenkirk recently recounted in an interview with Howard Stern that he demanded to beat up Hans and Franz if the sketch was going to air. He goes, if I do it, I have to beat them up. Dana Carvey said that they actually had to stop rehearsal for the sketch because Steven Skull was upset that he couldn't beat up Arnold Schwarzenegger in real life. His opening monologue wasn't even a monologue. He just sort of talk sings his way through Carl Douglas's kung fu fighting with Chris Rock and Tim Meadows singing backup for him. From that point on, every sketch involves Steven Seagal taking himself way too seriously, and almost all of them involve violence. Throughout the entire process, Steven Seagal would complain about jokes that didn't make sense to him, and refuse to take part in anything that came remotely close to satirizing who he was. Many of the cast members said that Seagal just didn't want to be there. Even beloved characters like the Richmeister wasn't safe from Steven Seagal's assault on the comedic art. Arts. Instead of playing along with the actual premise of the sketch, Seagull just abruptly begins beating up Rob Schneider and hanging him out of the window for seemingly no reason whatsoever. The final sketch of this infamous episode of Saturday Night Live isn't even really a sketch. It's just Steven Seagal fighting Exxon Mobil executives, the majority of whom weren't even played by cast members. SNL hired stuntmen for Seagull to fight for almost seven minutes before screaming, <laughs> This is what happens when you pollute the planet. There isn't even a premise to this sketch. It's just a weird lesson about environmentalism told through insanity and hip-tossing people through tables. A good SNL host will have, at the very least, some degree of self-awareness and be able to roll with the playful punches that Saturday Night Live dishes out. Plenty of hosts have prodded themselves during the opening monologue, and even more have created farcical sketches about their own existence. When SNL runs into hosts like these, the content reflects the host's willingness to play with the cast, and the episodes can be pretty funny. Some of the funniest SNL sketches have come from having hosts like Peyton Manning or Wayne Gretzky on the show, and those are two names that are about as far removed from comedy as you can get. When Saturday Night Live is firing on all cylinders, it is a force to be reckoned with. When the hosts, writers, and performers are all working in harmony to deliver the best possible product, there aren't many sketch comedy shows that can contend. But when Saturday Night Live fails, it very rarely falls squarely on the shoulders of the performers and writers. More often than not, it's due to the person who those people are writing and performing with being either unable to grasp the material or being unwilling to play along. So what's up next for the Dice Man? You got a movie coming out this summer? No. Comedy is fun to produce. There's actually a saying in sketch comedy and improv that goes something to the effect of, if you aren't having fun, then you're an Sure, comedy is grueling work that requires laser focus, sleepless nights, and a ton of effort. But at the end of the day, it's very fun to execute. But when you have someone that isn't willing to play along, it doesn't feel like fun anymore. It feels like the comedy itself is sort of marked for death before the show even airs. I don't want you to talk about about anything to me anymore. I don't want you to say my name anymore, you hear me? Everything's upside down. <laughs> and hey, that's it for today's episode. You might see a few links in the player window here. Feel free to click on any of those if you want to stick around. And thanks for watching Nerdstalgic.